Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Peter Lilenthal. He's uh, president and CEO of Homer Energy, and since 1993, he's the, been the brains behind the Homer uh, hybrid uh, power optimization software that many of you have received copies of through NREL. Um, it's been used by over 50,000 energy practitioners in over 193 countries to date. So uh, NREL has licensed Homer Energy uh, to be their sole worldwide commercialization license for distributing and enhancing the Homer model. And Peter was a senior economist with the International Programs Office at NREL from 1990 to 2007. He has a PhD in management science and engineering from Stanford, and uh, he's been active in the field of renewable energy and energy efficiency since 1978. That's a, a long time in this business. So welcome, Peter. Thank you, and th th thank all of you. Um, it's been really gratifying to hear that Homer is being used by as so many of you, and I, it, it just warms my heart. Um, and, and I'd also encourage you to, uh, we've we're been putting out newsletters, and we're starting to do it more regularly every month. So if you um, want us to do a case study on your project, we'll distribute it to our 50,000 user base. Uh, actually, it's about 37,000 active email, you know, legit, e real email people who, who continue to want to get our email. So it's 37,000 people that you could publicize your, your project to. Um, so let me, let me start up. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk real generally for just a minute about why this is important. It's obviously important here in Alaska, but I think what, what's going on here is, is really a trailblazer for the world. Um, the, the world's trying to move to clean power and um, at high penetration levels, or contra whatever. The, um, if you talk to utilities in the, in the lower 48, they say it can't be done. They're still saying, then they, not now they're saying, well, we can do low penetration. We can do 10 or 20%, but we can't do more than that. And so we're, you're proving that they can do it. And I really believe that the way it's going to happen is, is through microgrids. Um, so, and, and let me just talk for a minute about this bigger picture and why what's going on here is so important more broadly. The, there's a huge amount, and Hito alluded to this, and I, I, you can't underestimate this. There is just a huge amount of hype and money flowing to smart grid that nobody really knows what it is. Um, and, you know, I live in Boulder, Colorado, where they spent $140 million and accomplished almost nothing. Um, so uh, um, this pathway is what most people are thinking about, talking to the big utilities, and they're going to do this super grid, and it's all going to be this wonderfully centrally controlled sort of Soviet-style control thing. Um, and I just don't think that's going to work. Um, Meanwhile, you have uh, remote diesels like, like we have here, island systems, and, and also quite a lot of backup diesels in developing countries that are, that are, because of high fuel prices, are moving to high penetrations of renewables very quickly uh, and proving the concept. Uh, and then you add smart controls, you add load management, demand response, secondary loads, all the stuff we've been talking about for, uh, the last couple of days, and you've got a smart grid. It's a smart, clean microgrid. This is the pathway that's going to get us, get the rest of the world to that vision of a smart, clean uh, power system. And the rest of the world needs to really appreciate what's going on up here. And, and actually, they, they really, you're still under the radar screen. So we should fix that. Um, so moving on, what, what, what why did I create Homer and what, what's it for? Well, and what's the problem? And, and I think one of the big, there's, there's a lot of technical challenges people are working on. The one that I'm focusing on is that this is kind of confusing. There's too many choices. And you can, I've listed uh, some of them. And how do you sort this out? What do you use where? That's the fundamental uh, problem that Homer addresses. And it's the, I think it's a really fundamental problem to the whole industry is that we don't have a cookie cutter solution. If we had a Model T that we could stamp out, one size fits all, we'd be done. But um, we don't, and we probably never will really truly have that 
One of the advantages of these technologies is that they're small and modular, and you're, so it sounds like an advantage that you could customize them. And in, in some ways, that's an advantage, but actually it makes the design process more complicated, it confuses the customers, and um, it's only an advantage if there's a simple way to sort through it. So that's what I'm trying to, or, and, and the rest of my team at Homer Energy is trying to, to solve. So what's best really does depend on the application. Every situation is different. Uh, the resources are different, the loads are different, um, what it costs to actually put a foundation in the ground differs from place to place, and the, the equipment keeps changing. Um, so this, there is no, there's, it's a design challenge. And like I said, a, a conf I, I really believe this. I, I sold, I was, in my earlier life, I was doing sales, and the one thing I remember is a confused mind says no. If you confuse your customers, you don't have a customer. So um, how do we solve that problem? Well, we, we provide a simple tool that the customer can understand. And not only is it important that the customer be able to understand it, but these are smaller projects. So the power industry has a whole sub-industry of consultants, consulting engineers, et cetera, and they know how to design 300 megawatt coal plants. And a 300 megawatt plant has enough money to afford a whole army of engineers to design, to design it. But when you're talking about these smaller projects, we need a much more efficient development process. We can't afford that same development process that, that the power industry uses for large projects. We need something um, smaller, simpler, and putting more of the analytic capability in the hands of the customer. So, uh, and so uh, that's a simpler tool. So, so that's, that's part of our goal here, uh, is to provide that simple tool that doesn't cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to use, which is the norm in utility modeling. Um, because we're trying to grow an industry here. So to grow an industry, we need a lot of people of all different kinds, not just the engineers, understanding how these pieces all fit together. And so that, that's my little shtick about simple models, you know, the, the map. And, uh, um, <clears throat> so let me give a little background on, on the history of Homer, just very quickly. Uh, as Brad, Brent, excuse me, Brent alluded to, it was originally developed at NREL as part of the Village Power Program, which was an off uh, response to uh, commitments the president made at the Rio conference, in the Earth Summit in 1992. And it was very active in the 90s, kind of died off in the 2000 range. It was initially just an internal model because we were doing, designing projects internally and we needed an optimization tool just to help us understand what made sense where. Um, but in 1998, we converted it to a Windows platform, put it up on the web, and let the world take it. And before that, it had been a very awkward uh, Unix-based um, software, required special optimization software. Uh, but once we let people d download it, it sort of took off on its own. DOE is not really in the business of supporting u a global user base. So in 2000, it was a kind of a process it took. <laughs> a couple of years, but uh, I, w the, to create this spinoff in 2009, we got the license uh, and Homer Energy became the, ex the exclusive distributor supporter uh, and we're uh, um, coming out with a new version three in a couple of months. We have a National Science Foundation grant to, uh, that's been really helpful uh, and s I'll have a screenshot of that in a minute. Uh, so that'll be coming out <clears throat> in, a, in a couple of months. Um, so just a little background, we, we, we look at a lot of different technologies, I mean we're focused on wind here, but it does solar, hydro, biomass, it does a lot of the different hydrogen technologies, it has different kinds of, you, you can have uh, load management options, you can have up to 10 generators, you can have, there's a variety of storage options, you can be connected to the grid or not, you, you, cho you choose what you want to look at, everybody's got sort of different needs, and it draws you a one, a one line schematic. So. There was a discussion earlier about system architectures, and it's got quite a range of system architectures you can look at. It's worth, it's worth reinforcing that we're just doing energy. We're not doing reactive power. We're not doing uh, dynamic stability. We're not doing anything in the frequency domain. Uh, it's just a time series um, energy balance model. 
What, uh, but it's worthwhile to understand the sort of the frame, decision support framework inside of it. So, and the way I think of it, maybe because I'm uh, a little bit of programming background, th these are nested do loops. If you don't, if you're not a programmer, don't worry about what that means. But at, at its innermost core, it's meeting the load in every hour. So you have load, you have a variety of different loads, you have a variety of different resources, and it's going to meet that lo try to meet that load if it can. So um, that might mean turning on diesels. It might mean charging batteries or discharging batteries. And it does that consecutively every hour of the year. Um, it, it, we typically run it in hour time steps. It can run down to the one minute time step. So if you're modeling a storage technology like a flywheel that has only 15 minutes of storage, the, an hour time step is too long. So then you'd want to use a one minute time step. But typically, an hour is more typical. Um, does that for a whole year and it tells you how, um, how much fuel you're going to use, how much energy is going to go in and out of the battery, um, how, and, and from that it can estimate uh, maintenance costs and come up with an estimate for all of the costs. So it, 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 it um, does a net present value calculation with the capital costs, the fuel costs, the operating costs, the replacement costs, et cetera. Uh, and tells you how, what, what that particular system is going to cost. So that's the simulation loop. So that's one system. Then, but you've got design choices. Do you ever want one turbine or two or three or four? Do you want, how big should your storage be? Should you put in a new smaller <coughs> gen set? Um, does PV make sense? Do any of the other options make sense, et cetera? You've got all these design choices. Uh, so it will do that simulation for all the different design choices you have. Uh, depending on how complicated it could, that your design space is, that could be a thousand different systems, ranks them by life cycle cost. So you see the least cost one at the top, but you can look at all of them to compare them, et cetera. That's the optimization loop. So that tells you what's best. It's only telling you what's best for a particular situation. What if, what if you're wrong about the wind speed? What if your fuel prices change, which they're bound to do? What if the load grows? What if the technology comes down in price, et cetera, et cetera? So the sensitivity analysis is really valuable uh, to see how robust is that answer. How, if, how does that answer of what's best, depend, what does it depend on? Um, because I, maybe this is my training. I'm, I, I, although I can call myself an engineer or an economist, I really view myself more as an economist. I really think it does all come down to economics eventually. And what's n from, you know, the rest, most of the world suffers under high oil prices. Actually, we, the Alaska, the villages suffer under high oil prices, but our industry benefits from high oil prices. It depends which side of the industry, I guess, you're, you think you're on. But um, the fact that oil prices are going up makes this a sustainable business. Uh, saving fuel costs is what's going to make this into a big business. The chasing subsidies is not a real sustainable business plan because what the government gives, the government can take away. I think subsidies have a huge role to play in terms of jump-starting a new industry. There's all kinds of first-mover costs that, we've all, that, that we're dealing with now that are going to go away as experience grows. That's a really valid rationale for subsidies. But for this to really take off, it's, it's got, it all comes down to economics. So, so Homer will give you the economic analysis of a project. So for example, this, just some screenshots from a particular analysis I did. It has an internal rate of return 19%. That's pretty good. It's not spectacular, but it's, quite, it's, it's probably good enough for commercial financing. It'll give you the payback, gives you the whole cash flow you can see when replacements happen, so there's a, um, there's a battery, the blue there is a battery replacement in year, whatever that is, 10 or 12. Um, there is a red is an inverter replacement in year 15, et cetera. Obviously, there's a huge capital cost in the first year, and it does a, a net present value calculation to get a full life cycle cost. So that sensitivity analysis that I referred to, it, this is a, a good way of illustrating that. Let me just walk you through it. Homer did an optimization at each of these diamonds. Um, we did a sensitivity analysis across wind speeds ranging from 3 meters per second to 7 meters per second. 
and we did a diesel fuel price sensitivity from 40 cents a liter to $1.60 a liter. So at low fuel prices and low wind speeds, renewables aren't cost effective. Um, above about 62 cents a liter in this particular case, which happens to be a small village in the Philippines, but uh, that's where photovoltaics becomes cost effective for that site. Um, and then you have a line here where wind becomes cost effective. Um, intuitively, a lot of people think, well, wind and PV have a natural synergy. It's sunny in the summer and it tends to be windy in the winter. And so maybe they make a good hybrid and that's true in certain situations. That's the green area here where you have modest winds. But, but if, you have a, if you have a good wind resource, it sort of doesn't matter how good the solar resource is. Wind, wind um, power is, is proportional to the cube. So in a good wind resource, even, doesn't, even if you're in Hawaii or the Philippines, the, the wind is more cost effective. So that's not necessarily intuitive, but the graph makes it pretty obvious. So this kind of sensitivity analysis, we think, is really valuable for giving people the big picture of what makes sense. So, um, so let me show you just some examples of some analyses that we did. This one we did in, in Hawaii, in a small island in Molokai. Um, and my, you know, my little <laughs> bow to Hito here. I, I, I do agree with him that outside of this, when I talk to people outside of this community, they, they actually don't get, I don't get giggles, I get like uh, cringes when I use this word. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, but I like, I think it's more descriptive in a way. I, so it's a bit of a challenge to figure out what to say here. But I, anyway, so we did this analysis in Molokai. Right now, without wind, they use over 11 million liters per year of um, diesel fuel. And I've sort of marked on here approximately, the, the, these definitions of low, medium, high, it's absolutely true. Everybody's got a slightly different definition. And even, the, even something as simple as a number, this percentage number is all over the map. And depending on how you define this word penetration contribution, it's, it's, a, it's a ratio of two numbers and everybody uses two different numbers. So um, this is all just general. Uh, but the, uh, the interesting thing here is because they have an excellent wind resource, uh, it's cost effective for them to put in quite a bit of wind and really dramatically reduce their, their fuel consumption. Uh, and, but you do reach this diminishing returns where uh, you start requiring large quantities of storage. So storage is expensive. I talked to a lot of people who, uh, who want to do 100% renewables, and there was that presentation for the small, the smaller the system, like that little island in the Bahamas, it starts to become more cost effective, especially for the, I, I love that expression I just heard, the RGGs, the rich green guys. Um, that's great, I'm gonna use that. Uh, and, but, and so the RGG guys like this 100% renewable thing, but this curve starts to get really steep. And where it starts to get really steep, is, it's important to know that. Because if you, you talk to people with this hand waving who haven't done any analysis, and you know, some people are saying, no, 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 it's too expensive, we can't do anything. And some people are saying, no, we have to go to 100% renewable. And they're, they're not even, they're, there's no communication going on there. There's, you, you need a graph like this to get people to decide, to, to really focus on what makes sense. So let me look at some other exa examples of the kinds of questions we can answer. We saw a presentation um, a couple of um, earlier about the cost of foundations, which is kind of mind-boggling, really, for those of us who don't do, actually build things with our, don't use our hands for anything. <laughs> seeing, <laughs> seeing, actually watching a presentation like that about what it actually takes to put something in the ground here is is really um, mind-blowing, actually. And so it's those costs are all over the map. So what, what's the effect on project economics? Uh, so I, this, I, I, I did three runs. This took a couple of minutes last night, actually, uh, to show, that, so the, the, again, this is the line where wind becomes cost effective. And I used the Northern Power uh, 100 as an, as an example, and I don't know if $300,000 is a realistic cost or not, so I did a whole range of costs here. And, but if $300,000 is a range, this thing's cost effective even in very modest wind resources. Of course, it depends. I don't know if you can see. We're again, we're going from three to eight meters per second, and from shoot, 
uh, from 50 cents a liter all the way up to $2 a liter. So, you know, it's quite a large range here. Um, but as you start increasing the cost of that foundation and the other logistics, if you get up to $900,000, it doesn't matter what the wind regime is. If you're, if, and if fuel prices is 50 cents a liter, it's not going to be cost effective. Um, you get up to a dollar, a dollar fifty a liter. It starts to look cost effective even at the higher foundation costs. So you've got you got a lot of moving variables here. This is only showing three of them, it, and they affect each other, and it matters uh, in terms of identifying what's cost effective. Another uh, issue that came up um, in David's presentation this morning is, well, you you put it in the wind, and it affects the efficiency of the diesel plant, and that's true. Well, it, does it reduce the, effect, the efficiency of the diesel plant so much that the wind's not cost effective? Well, probably not, but this isn't the kind of question that you can answer just waving your hands or doodling on an envelope. Um, so, it, uh, so that's where you need a model to actually work through all the analysis. Um, so it not only reduces the efficiency of the diesel plant, but there's, another, there's this other issue that he alluded to, which is if you're using the diesel less, you're getting less waste heat. But maybe you're getting excess energy from the su secondary load controller, you're getting, you're getting heat from the um, dump load or the secondary load. Does that, is that enough to make up for the heat you're losing from the waste heat um, off the generator? Probably not, it but it depends. If you put enough wind turbines in, it might be. The, the, the understanding all those trade-offs is not intuitive. And that's what the model is great for. So this is just an example where we, we looked at, well, what happens when you change the thermal load and, and, and how does that affect project economics? A couple other insights that just in general I wanted to throw out from doing a lot of modeling. Um, one is, I should be kind of obvious from the conversation today, but it's not obvious to the general public at all. They, they think, well, renewable is never going to work because what do you do when the wind doesn't blow? Well, you do what you've always done. So that's actually easy. We, we, know, we know what to do. When the wind doesn't blow, we do what we've always done. The problem is, what do you do when the wind blows too strong? And so that's not obvious to, to the general public. It's probably becoming obvious to most people here. But it's a useful insight. Uh, another insight is that a little bit of storage goes a long way. And that's, that's why those curves start to get really steep. So um, I hear a lot of people doing this back of the head, back of the envelope kind of analysis saying, well, if I have this much wind, I need an equal amount of storage. And that's just not right. But actually, how much storage do you need? Well, you've got to do the modeling. Um, also, the easiest application for people to get their head around for storage is to load shifting. Well, it's, you know, it's sunny in the daytime and it's dark at night, so we'll store up in the daytime and use it at night. Uh, that's the easiest, that's a lot simpler to understand than frequency regulation, but it's actually the least cost effective uh, application for storage. So then that becomes obvious when you do a little bit of modeling. And the other thing is that we've spent billions and billions of dollars on really some really poorly thought out energy concepts that they, we should have done the modeling first, you know, and, and modeling sort of a cheap way to, or inexpensive way to um, experiment with new concepts. So just some more results. We've got some hourly results. I'm running out of time. I'm not going to show. This is a ranking of the different system types. And I just thought I'd show, throw up some, some screenshots, talk a little bit about where we're going as a company. We, we obviously are coming out with a new version of the software. We're always going to have a free version. We have the legacy version, but we're going to come out with a new, very simple sort of st um, stepping stone kind of free version as well. Uh, as a training uh, tool, et cetera. Uh, we, we customize the software for um, customized applications. We do consulting and training, et cetera. And we have this user base of 50,000 people who are like you, but all over the world, experimenting with hybrid power system design. And I think there's an enormous potential. I, I'll admit I haven't, we're not taking full advantage of this yet, of learning from what other people are doing all over the world. Um, and a lot of them are doing solar diesel or looking at solar diesel, and that's got similar, it's got differences, it's got similarities. There's a lot of um, cross fertilization that I think we could really benefit from um, through the Homer user community. Um, just some examples of how it 
I'm so now I'm just sort of showing off of stuff like how fast our user community is growing and the kinds of systems that we look at. I'm low on time, so I'm just going to race through um, most of it. Most of the user community is outside of the U.S. All over the world, the the developing world is an overlooked market for this, and so it's a difficult market to to, to deal with in many ways. But that's there's three million barrels a day of oil used to produce electricity. That, that, to someone from the lower 48, that is a mind-boggling number. The folks up here in Alaska know, oh yeah, we burn oil to make electricity. Well, nobody in the lower 48 does. Alaska and Hawaii do, but there's islands all over the world that do. There's developing countries that do. There's people with, un with seriously unreliable grids that where everybody has a backup generator who can possibly afford it. There's three million barrels a day of oil used to produce electricity, and that's that's got to change. That's a huge market. Um, just a screenshot of the new version. It's just to sort of tease you. Stay tuned. A couple of weeks, a couple of months from now, we'll we'll have that out. We'll be looking for some beta testers, and that's my presentation. A couple of questions for Peter from anyone. Yes. I'm sorry, which, which efficiency are you talking about? Um, kilowatt hours per gallon. Um, and you're saying the rural communities are closer. So, kilo, but most part, outside of rural communities in Alaska, people don't really burn oil from electricity. Well, that's a, so that's my question. Are we, do we look like we are the national average because our data is what's being burned right now? For kilowatt hours of, of, of uh, electricity? From gallons of oil? From gallons of diesel fuel. You know, that could well be. I, 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 I now I'm, I, I'd like to see those statistics, um, uh, so I don't know for sure. Cause I, I, but that sounds like a reasonable hypothesis. Um, it, I, yeah, let's talk afterwards. I'd love to see those statistics. Right, well, it's, it's a, that's a very good point because Homer, Homer tells you what's cost effective. It's not that good at telling you, well, actually, is this system stable, right? So at the, at the behest of PowerCorp, we actually have put in little warnings now when we, that say, well, you know, you ought to check whether this, this system's stable or not. Um, you need a, a dynamic stability model. And, and the, the, the problem is those models can't really look at a whole year at a, at a time. They, so, and what we'd like to do, it's kind of an ambitious project, so we don't have funding for it, but 
we would love to be able to integrate with one of those models so you have a single interface and to make it, you, you are gonna have to go back and forth between the two models. Those models can tell you what's stable, but they can't tell you, and you can always make it stable by just adding more stuff until it's not economic anymore. So, um, so you, you really need both, and it'd be nice to be able to go back and forth easily between the two, and it'd be nice to be able to, uh, I would love to make that a smoother process. There's a whole lot of those dynamic stability models. Some of them are extremely expensive. Uh, we're looking around to try to find the, uh, the simplest, least expensive one that we should integrate with. And um, I don't know if we have time to throw it out to the audience. Who, does anybody have a suggestion for a sim what's the simplest, least expensive of those dynamic stability models? Um, I bet there are people here who do know that, though. But I think in the interest of time at the moment, we'll, that'll be a yeah, sure. elbow-bending discussion. OK. okay. Thank you, Peter. Sure. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, our next uh, event. It, it, we're going to be double teamed by uh, Kirk Garrett of Susitna Energy Systems and Jay Yeager of Southwest Wind Power. And uh, they're going to be talking about a microgrid concept to uh, renewable development. A little bit about Kirk. Uh, he practices what he preaches. He is one of the uh, um, well-known uh, sellers of renewable energy systems in Alaska. And he got into that because he lived off-grid at a place called Flathorn Lake. And uh, he needed to find some products to make electricity. They weren't available in Alaska. So he started importing them and selling them to others. And he's been doing a great job of it. Um, Jay Yeager. He currently resides in Flagstaff, Arizona. We're glad that you can come up on this trip. And we, I know that he's been up here for other um, installations of uh, his Skystream turbines. Uh, he works full time for Southwest Wind Power. Southwest Wind Power is a world leader and maker of small turbines. And uh, we welcome Kirk and Jay. Thanks. Thank you, Brent. First of all, I hope uh, we can keep your attention for the full time span that we were allotted. Cat, <laughs> um, what do we do here? Just press the down button? Yes, it works. Okay. As you can tell, um, I'm a hands-on guy. I, I don't deal with computers a whole lot. I'd rather be out in the field putting up a wind turbine. Uh, we started Susitna Energy out of my garage quite some time ago when we wanted to do a system for ourselves at Flathorn Lake. Uh, I couldn't find anybody up here that could really help me. I was uh, contacting California on a regular basis and I pretty much made every mistake that you can make and we've learned from what works to what definitely doesn't work. We've uh, done systems all across the state. Uh, actually, we've done some down in the lower 48 and overseas also, but our primary mission is to help rural Alaskans and people who want to have a quality lifestyle off the grid and now even on grid with grid solar and grid wind. And I'm pleased to announce that I have two of the Southwest Wind Power Sky Streams hooked to ML and P for the first time. Need to get a little closer? Yep. We got two sky streams on Fairbank Street that are now hooked to MLMP. The first two, it took three and a half years of hard, diligent work on my part to convince the municipality of Anchorage that wind is not a bad idea. And I'm real proud of that. We also have two on Chugach Electric at Partouche Plumbing. So those are four working examples in the municipality of Anchorage. Perryville is one of our shining examples of what we think we can do for smaller villages. If you've been to the small villages, you understand what kind of energy issues they have. Uh, last summer I was in a village, I'm not gonna say where, but I sat there and watched a lady come up with a gallon can, Coleman jug, and she bought a gallon of fuel. And when she was walking away, 
She said, we're going to have heat tonight. And there's some real serious issues happening in western Alaska, okay? And it's discouraging that a, co uh, a country that we live in has all these energy issues. And I'd like to point out one thing Peter said. The government doesn't give you anything that they didn't already take from you. And that's a real accurate point. I'd like Jay Yeager, who's a personal friend. I, I actually call him MacGyver, because he's done some pretty amazing things with us uh, to expound on the turbine itself, and then I'll step back in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, the turbine we're here discussing today is the Skystream 3.7. Uh, the, the turbine was originally commissioned for development by the Department of Energy as the next residential class wind turbine for direct grid connected applications. Uh, we filled that uh, requirement very well and after having done that we really kind of wondered what we should do next and and looked at the turbine in, in a new perspective and and tried to find growing and, and greater applications for this technology. It's a relatively small machine by the standards that uh, we are talking about here over the last two days. It's a sub 10 kilowatt machine. It's, uh, you might, some of you may have seen it in the, in the room next door. It's, it's a full size production version of that machine. Uh, it's rated conservatively at 2.4 kilowatts. Uh, it has a 3.7 meter diameter blade and uh, it is a, an entirely integrated machine in that the inverter is housed within the nacelle and, uh, and so, uh, in other words, all power conditioning and control go on within the body of the machine itself. So it's a very tidy, compact little unit. Uh, all you have to really do is give it an ordinary grid-like power supply and it will take over from there. Uh, I don't know how well you can perhaps see some of the, the specifications from the audience. Uh, at some point when we have questions, if you have specific questions, I'll be glad to answer more about it. You gotta love the small print. I can't hardly read it and I'm standing up here. <laughs> anyway, uh, Perryville. I was invited to Perryville by uh, the leaders of Perryville and they asked me if I'd come down and, uh, and talk to them about energy issues. And I accepted their invitation, I flew down there and. And when we walked into the little meeting hall, I kind of had this look of, wow, look at all these faces of deer in the headlights, you know. I said, what's wrong? And uh, they said, well, we didn't think you'd come. <laughs> but uh, it was one of the best experiences that I, I can honestly say that I've been involved with because these people are genuinely concerned about their village. They want to make sure that they're around for a long time. They've seen other villages around them disappear for numerous reasons, but Perryville is a, a beautiful place and it's full of nice people. The village actually purchased their turbines from me and they did it with village funds. They own and they operate and they maintain their wind farm. They own 10 sky streams on 70 foot towers. The towers are made out of five inch schedule 40 pipe. They tilt down to the ground, so all maintenance is done on the ground. Nobody climbs anything. We've been looking at the return on investment, and uh, you know, my personal feeling is that uh, there's a lot of give and take on this because at 60 cents kilowatt hours, they're, they're assuming 10 year payback. But I believe right now the cost of energy in Perryville is up to 95 cents kilowatt hour because of fuel prices. Uh, the return on investment at 6,000 gallons of fuel a year at $4.50 a gallon, six years. Pretty good deal. Gas, diesel fuel this morning, driving from Anchorage, was $4.15 a gallon for diesel fuel, and that's in Anchorage, and that's today. And that's just with oil at $112 a barrel. I don't know about what you really believe in your heart, but I don't think Oil is going to stay anywhere close to that with, with the world conditions that we have right now. 
They actually purchased their uh, system with 10 sky streams in 07. Uh, it took a while to get things laid out for them and Jay and I went down and helped them lay things out. One thing I wanted to point out is uh, we didn't employ anyone on this project from Susitna Energy. The village of Perryville managed this project and employed all the workers. It was 100% village contained. So I applaud Northwind for hiring 30 people, but we didn't hire anybody. We worked for them at no charge. Um, there's a lot of pride in that statement because when being a crane operator for 35 years, I'd go to all these locations and work. And I always watched and see what was available locally. Jobs that are in these local villages are really hard to get. The state spends lots of money trying to create jobs in these little villages. And we were proud that all the work involved with our project was by village residents. They have a 25 kW wind farm. Although typically these, uh, these figures are rather understated, I believe, because we see 3,000 watts coming out of each one of them pretty consistently, wherever we have them. And they are connected to 120 kW John Deere diesel. The whole aspect of this project was when I was talking to the village of Perryville, they wanted to get off a 220 kW Cummins and switch to their smaller generator. But they couldn't do it when school was in session. When they added the wind, that's where they could switch to the 120 kW. So they had a tremendous fuel savings right there. And they're stating now that the 120 is just kind of loafing along. It might not be 100% efficient loafing along, but it sure certainly is a heck of a lot better than running the generator that uses twice the fuel. It's a class two wind regime. A lot of, uh, a lot of professionals will say, well, it isn't worth doing wind in class two. But we think it is. And to date, uh, they've produced uh, greater than 65 megawatt hours. Some of the key benefits we'd like to size on is uh, size and scalability of multiple small wind systems that can be maintained are a better application for some of these places. I firmly believe big turbines belong in the hubs. That's my feeling. I know a lot of you will disagree, but if you can't maintain it where it is and something goes wrong, you're right back where you start. We can produce very short cycle times between project implementation and completion. It's pretty, pretty simple to find a zoom boom and a small excavator in almost any village. But it's pretty hard to find a 100 ton lattice boom crane and a barge to move it around. And our self erecting towers did not need any special equipment. We try to keep the technology pretty simple. Basically, we use a winch. And if we have a pickup truck with a two inch schedule 40 hitch, we're, we're good to go. Uh, all the assembly and maintenance performed on the ground. We feel that that's the safest way to work on this equipment. I don't like climbing towers and you can see I'm not built for that. Uh, I can't even get Jay to climb a tower. <laughs> and the economic development and new local employment is always good in these small villages. Like I said, the state spends millions of dollars trying to create jobs. We show up and we have a job for anybody who wants to work. If you can run a number two shovel, you can put in a sky stream. Um, minimum balance of systems requirements. If you already have a grid, we can connect to it. If it's UL, good for you. If it isn't, still accommodate it because we have the ability to reprogram. And we can do it over the internet if we have an ad adequate uh, communication system. 